Welcome, I'm Corey Huffman and this is my writing channel, where I do my best to tackle the technical aspects of writing narrative prose in the hopes of both improving my own craft and maybe helping a few aspiring writers like yourself along the way. Sorry it's been a while, but I've been tirelessly editing my long-awaited epic titled Reflections of the Same. Stay tuned for more on that. In this video, I'd like to take you through a description of setting and character written by George R. R. Martin, author of A Game of Thrones, as he does a great job at dismantling complex descriptions into concise, digestible chunks. Now remember, concise doesn't necessarily involve making every sentence short. You want to describe a given piece of information in as few words as possible, but not at the expense of its intended meaning. In other words, trim the fat, but don't cut into the meat. It's perfectly alright to include multiple pieces of information in a sentence when you're describing, let's say, a castle, from its parapets to its walls to its gate, and so on. But within that given sentence, try not to let your focus stray and start talking about the weather or the people, for example. In almost every instance, it's best to save descriptions which have a different focus for a different sentence. If nothing else, studying Martin's writing has provided me with clarity with regards to drawing the descriptive boundaries of a given sentence. And it's my humble hope that in watching this video, you may glean a few of these insights without having to commit to such intensive study. Now, let's move on to George R. R. Martin and his wonderful prose, and take a look at one example from the beginning of A Game of Thrones, where he delivers some exquisite description of the castle of Winterfell through the perspective of Bran, a seven-year-old boy. The rooftops of Winterfell were Bran's second home. His mother often said that Bran could climb before he could walk. Bran could not remember when he first learned to walk, but he could not remember when he started to climb, either, so he supposed it must be true. To a boy, Winterfell was a grey stone labyrinth of walls and towers and courtyards and tunnels spreading out in all directions. In the older part of the castle, the halls slanted up and down so that you couldn't even be sure what floor you were on. The place had grown over the centuries like some monstrous stone tree, Maester Lewin told him once, and its branches were gnarled and thick and twisted, its roots sunk deep into the earth. When he got out from under it and scrambled up near the sky, Bran could see all of Winterfell in a glance. He liked the way it looked, spread out beneath him, only birds wheeling over his head while all the life of the castle went on below. Bran could perch for hours among the shapeless, rain-worn gargoyles that brooded over the first keep, watching it all. The men drilling with wood and steel in the yard, the cooks tending their vegetables in the glass garden, restless dogs running back and forth in the kennels, the silence of the god's wood, the girls gossiping beside the washing well. It made him feel like he was lord of the castle, in a way even Rob would never know. That was another thing he liked about climbing. It was almost like being invisible. He liked how it felt, too, pulling himself up on a wall stone by stone, fingers and toes digging hard into the small crevices between. He always took off his boots and went barefoot when he climbed. It made him feel as if he had four hands instead of two. He liked the deep, sweet ache it left in the muscles afterward. He liked the way the air tasted way high up, sweet and cold as a winter peach. He liked the birds, the crows in the broken tower, the tiny little sparrows that nested in cracks between the stones, the ancient owl that slept in the dusty loft above the old armory. Bran knew them all. Most of all, he liked going places that no one else could go, and seeing the grey sprawl of Winterfell in a way that no one else ever saw it. It made the whole castle Bran's secret place. His favorite haunt was the Broken Tower. Once it had been a watchtower, the tallest in Winterfell. A long time ago, a hundred years before even his father had been born, a lightning strike had set it afire. The top third of the structure had collapsed inward, and the tower had never been rebuilt. Sometimes his father sent ratters into the base of the tower, to clean out the nests they always found among the jumble of fallen stones and charred and rotten beams. But no one ever got up to the jagged top of the structure now except for Bran and the crows. He knew two ways to get there. When read from start to finish, the sequence is terrific, not only on a sentence-to-sentence -sentence basis, but in how it foreshadows events that occur right at the end of this chapter, which ends with a twist, but you'll get no spoilers from me. What I want to draw your attention to, you future bestseller you, is how Martin breaks up his information into easily digestible chunks. As a reader, you may not think much of it, but that's just the point. Good writing, unless intentionally poetic, is as easily read as the complexity of the topic allows, and often passes by unnoticed. Here, note how Martin is not only describing the castle of Winterfell, but using this description of setting to describe the character Bran. I mention this frequently, and I'll mention it again. High-quality writing accomplishes multiple narrative tasks simultaneously. Now, let's break this sequence down sentence by sentence, so you can better understand how to segment a long conveyor belt of information. First, we have a comparison, period. Then, a statement of fact, period, followed by an elaboration on this statement via Bran's introspection, period. Think of each sentence as an attempt to hone in on one topic, regardless of whether the lens of your description is narrow or broad. 
You may describe multiple aspects of this topic within a given sentence, but only so long as every aspect relates to the chosen topic. One purposeful piece in a vast narrative puzzle. When you want to redirect the reader's focus, drop a period and start another sentence. Next, Martin gives us a general overview of what's being described, likening Winterfell's walls, towers, courtyards, and tunnels to a labyrinth. There are two main options when describing a setting. You can either start specific and gradually widen your focus, or start broad and gradually hone in on specific details. Here, Martin chooses to start broad. This next sentence lends a bit of character to the castle, conveying to the reader that parts of it are very old and that it's not a castle where every stone is perfectly placed. This detail is elaborated on in the next sentence, where Martin compares Winterfell to a monstrous stone tree, using words like gnarled, thick, and twisted, as well as the phrase sunk deep into the earth, all of which have the same descriptive focus. This next sentence is what I call a setup sentence, because it sets the stage for more specific description. Remember, Martin started off this description broad, so he must get more and more specific. The following sentence hones in on the birds and ends in a transition with, while all the life of the castle went on below. This is a transition because it gives rise to an expectation or question in the reader's mind, namely, what's going on below. After adding the brief description of the gargoyles, Martin is quick to fulfill this promise using the colon technique, which is well suited to the task of listing off a series of descriptions. Check out my video on Herman Wouk's masterful descriptions, linked below, if you want to learn a multitude of these techniques. Remember, it's alright to describe many pieces of information in a given sentence, just make sure they are all related. In this case, the men, the cooks, the dogs, the godswood, and the girls are all related by the simple fact that these are all things that Bran sees going on below. Martin then caps off this description of setting with some character introspection, a balancing act he does often and exceptionally well. Here, a little later on in the sequence which describes Winterfell, Martin brings the focus back to Bran's love of climbing. Notice how he breaks up his sentences into the individual aspects of climbing Bran enjoys, using the technique of repetition with regards to the word liked. First, it's like being invisible. Second, Bran likes how it feels, and Martin provides some necessary and descriptive elaboration. Next, it's how Bran likes being barefoot, again with some elaboration on what specifically he enjoys about it. And finally, how he likes the ache that climbing leaves in his muscles. Because each of these aspects are related to a single topic, namely Bran's love of climbing, you could technically include them all in a single, long sentence, but the more specific your description gets, the more you need to draw more subtle boundaries. After this introspective description, Martin transitions back to the description of the setting, blending the two together. Bran likes the taste of the air, again, Martin elaborates. Bran likes the birds, and Martin elaborates not only on the type of birds, but where they roost. Notice how Martin has gotten more and more specific with his description. He started off referring to the walls, towers, and tunnels, and now he's talking about the ancient owl that slept in the dusty loft above the old armory. But most of all, Bran likes going places that no one else could go, and the place he likes going most is the Broken Tower. Again, this is a transition sentence, using introspection to segue into a description of a specific aspect of the setting, namely, the Broken Tower. Martin begins the description of this tower chronologically, which is a neat technique, and breaks up each piece of information into easily digestible chunks. First, it had once been a watchtower, the tallest in Winterfell. Then, a lightning strike had set it afire. In the next sentence, Martin describes the result of that action. Because these pieces of information are directly related, he could have blended these two sentences together, writing, A long time ago, a hundred years before even his father had been born, a lightning strike had set it afire, and the top third of the structure had collapsed inward. The tower had never been rebuilt. But to each his own. There isn't any correct way to do it. At this point, it just comes down to the writer's preference. Either way, the chronological sequence of events adds to the description of the present-day watchtower, including the sentence about his father sending ratters into the base of the tower, which mentions the jumble of fallen stones and the charred and rotten beams. Martin then goes on to call the top of the structure jagged, and mentions that it was only inhabited by crows and, occasionally, by Bran himself. I decided to cut off the excerpt here, with a final transition sentence. Any guesses as to what Martin is about to write? There's no telling what the specifics may be, but it's clear from this sentence that Martin is about to describe the two ways to get there. These transition sentences help to lubricate your prose, allowing them to flow, as well as giving the reader a breather so they don't feel like you're beating them over the head with sentence after sentence of detailed description. Anyway, I hope you found these techniques useful. Give them a try next time you sit down to write, and be sure to like and subscribe for more technical writing videos.